Maybe if I get somebody to shut the door back there would uh, help. Thank you. All right, well, thank you for coming. My name is Philip Davis. I'll be co-presenting with Kurt Minke. He's one of the SMEs that helped develop the curriculum. So uh, between us, we'll try to tag team and keep within our 35 minutes, and hopefully we'll have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, I would like to start out by saying that we're trying to organize an educator's bird of, birds of the feather tomorrow evening. I think at 8.30 was the only time slot that was available. So if you look on the board right in front of the, the main foyer down there, there's a birds of the feather we propose that. So hopefully, uh, if there's educators in the in the room or people that want to talk about education and uh, open source, we can get together and talk tomorrow night and also just spread the word to other people if you see them that are interested in that. So again, my name is Philip Davis. I'm a uh, professor of uh, computer science at Del Mar College. We're a two-year community college in uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas. I've been in, in GIS education for about a decade now, uh, computer science before that. I've managed a couple of NSF and DOL grants, which is how I got to here today. So what I want to talk about is uh, this thing called uh, building a new phosphor G technology workforce. Uh, in, at the two-year community college level, what we're particularly interested in is, is building technicians for the workforce. And what I've seen over the last decade in here is that on the commercial side, we're doing a really, a really good job of that, especially here in the U.S. We have excellent GIS programs at uh, quite a few two-year and four-year uh, universities and colleges for commercial GIS software, but when it comes to open source, we're lagging way behind. So what I've been doing for the past three years is trying to promote that in terms of curriculum resources for educators and then training and whatever else it takes to try to, to get that going. So that's the, t the title of the talk. The opportunity, uh, these are just some numbers I pulled out, the size of our industry. I think a lot of you realize that, that GIS is a fairly significant uh, industry. But if you look at it on a global scale, it's literally a huge industry. Uh, Oxera, which was uh, commissioned by Google a couple years ago to do a study, said that geospatial, if you look at it on a global scale, is five to ten times the size of the video game industry, which is not small by any means. And it's at least one third the size of the global airline industry, which is one of the largest in the world. Um, and then also, there was a great quote from the Eclipse Foundation article by Jeff Zeiss. Uh, recently talking about how there's a lot of potential uh, and he was talking particularly about just one industry that is the, the electrical generation and, and distribution how there's a huge potential for companies there to adopt open source so I think the market for open source geospatial is just started uh, to to see the potential but the issue that we're going to have is where the, technolo the technology workers that are going to fill those jobs and grow the industry if that's what we want it to do so for me, I say the challenge for open source adoption, particularly in, in education, is currently less than 5% of U.S. colleges and universities uh, offer any kind of training in open source software. Uh, and you, you do find two and four year universities that do a good job at it, uh, but again, they're far and few between. Um, Esri Higher Education Group reports that ArcGIS is currently used in 7,000 colleges and universities worldwide. So if you think about it, there's about 2,800 colleges in the United States, and Esri, I'm pretty sure, is in every one of those that has any kind of geospatial or geography program. So globally, uh, commercial software is found in 7,000 universities, and I think globally you probably would be lucky to find it in several hundred universities for open source. I know there's uh, Geo4Open, which is, which is a relatively new ICA, OSGEO initiative trying to get geospatial technology into universities and colleges. Currently we're standing at about 91 universities that have joined that initiative. Um, so we have a long ways to go is essentially. So it's 7,000 colleges and universities versus 100 basically. Uh, commercial phosphor G training uh, are uh, far few between and predominantly um, uh, place-based face-to-face. So if you want to get trained up in quantum or QGIS, or if you want to get trained up in, in any of the open source technologies, you've really got to look for a provider in your area to do that. Uh, it's a lack of recognized open source industry certification. I think that's going to be solved this year for QGIS. Uh, I know the QGIS uh, project has talked about doing their own industry certification finally. Uh, the educators have been making a lot of noise about that for the last year or two. We would like to have certification out there. As an educator, it's better for me, it's easier for me to train to a certification, if you will, uh, than it is just to come up with my own curriculum. 
So it's always better for us as educators if industry will lead the effort and tell us exactly what it is that they want their workers to know, then it makes it easier for us to uh, develop material for that. Uh, commercial vendors have a well-established training program and certification pathways. So there's a lot of challenges for open source. So what, what, I try, what I've tried to do on sort of an individual basis with the limited resources that I have is to try to kickstart this thing, if you will. So I came up with this thing called the Geocademy. And again, that was just a, sort of a, a brain fart that I came up with a couple years ago. And what the Geocademy is, is really just a loose confederation of US-based researchers and educators. So Kurt is a, is a private consultant in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He teaches part-time for a university in two-year community college area, which is how we knew each other. There's a couple of other people involved in this, but we have no formal or financial uh, collaboration. We're not a company. We're not even a college. We're just a group of educators that are interested in promoting open source. Um, the curriculum development effort has spanned three years and has resulted in what we think is an integrated set of five uh, courses that Kurt will talk about quickly. Uh, pedagogically, it's based upon the U.S. Department of Labor's Geospatial Technology Competency Model, the GTCM. You may be familiar with that. So the background of what is being taught in these courses, what's being offered, is based in something. It's based on a standard that we have, which is a GTCM. Uh, and it was developed using funds from the National Science Foundation along with the Department of Labor Grant. Therefore, all the material that you'll see today uh, is going to be offered under Creative Commons. It's already out there under Creative Commons. We're redoing versions of it as we speak. The first lab just came into my inbox this morning uh, on the new 2.8.1. So all this material will be available for you to download uh, shortly. So the goals were to expand the use of open source GIS in college and universities to prepare our future workers. Um, to provide educators and trainers with the foundational open source, uh, open education resources. If you go and look at the commercial side of it, how many of you have ever used uh, Esri's virtual campus? I mean, if you look at what they've got out there, it's wonderful resources. So if you were a new geography teacher trying to teach GIS and you need education resources, you just call up Esri. They send with their higher ed team out there and bam, you know, you're set up, you got all the material. If you're trying to do that in open source, good luck. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be hard to, to, to find the material. So until we have that repository, uh, then we've got a long ways to go. A third thing we'd like to do is expand the OS Geo uh, ICA ISPRS Geo for All initiative. How many of you have heard of the Geo for All? Not a lot, but um, if you just look on Geo for All, forall.org. Basically, it's just a nonprofit. We're just part of OSGO. We're a project in OSGO trying to get open source into uh, higher education. And so if you're associated with a college or university, if you'd like to apply for it, it's got fairly low barriers of entry. There's zero cost. And the collaboration is wonderful. Once you get on the wikis and the listservs, you get all kinds of resources available. And like I say, currently we're up to almost 100 universities and colleges. Uh, so encourage your university uh, to join that if you haven't already. We also want to demonstrate the success of the academy materials for online learning and try to spearhead uh, teaching opportunities to work um, with remote and underserved populations from around the globe. And then finally, to build a self-sustaining community of practice among the educators. That last goal is really what is what I'm passionate about, and that is to get a group of educators that are using open source that will collaborate with one another and support one another. If we get to that point, folks, then we succeeded. Then the, the community will grow. But until we get to that point, it's going to be a little bit of, a, of an effort. What I'd like to do is ask Kurt to come up. Kurt was one of the uh, three SMEs that we had to develop material and talk a little bit about the, uh, the five courses. Kurt. This is harder than developing the curriculum. Okay, uh, again, my, yeah, my name's Kurt Menke, and I'm a GIS consultant based in Albuquerque. Um, kind of an old hand at GIS. I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, 
and it's exciting to see the educational material getting to this point. So I'm just going to quickly run through the five courses that are part of this Geo Academy. Um, the first one is GST 101, and with all of these, what we're basically doing is teaching students how to do GIS but using open source. So we're not just teaching people how to use QGIS, we're really teaching all the fundamentals of GIS along the way. Um, this first course covers things like data models, working with spatial reference systems, editing data, geo-referencing, and some, some very basic remote sensing and spatial analysis principles. I'll give you a couple screenshots of what some of the material is. Um, so like in this class, there's seven labs. Um, one of them covers cartography, where you make a, a map here of greater sage-grouse habitat in the western US. Um, in these labs also, one, one thing we've done is developed YouTube videos. So if a lab has four tasks in it, there'll be a YouTube video for each task. So for people who don't want to sit there and read a 25-page lab, they can watch a four or five minute YouTube video and see the basic uh, points of that lab exercise. It covers geo-referencing using the geo-referencing plug-in, um, vector data editing, just the, the basics of editing vector data, and then finishes up in the last lab of the first course with doing a basic spatial analysis where you have to select by location, um, do some buffering and, and some, some of those simple vector analysis techniques. The 102 class kind of goes from there and feeds, um, focuses on spatial analysis. So you learn how to do the basic vector overlay techniques like intersect, union. This is a screenshot of identifying um, the overlap between two habitat layers on a national forest. You learn how to use the graphical modeler, which I think is one of the pretty exciting, fairly new pieces of QGIS where you can automate workflows. Learn how to uh, develop surfaces from points, um, as like they call them heat maps in QGIS, interpolate a surface, um, do buffers, select by location, in this case to uh, buffer the path of a tornado in a community and then identify the parcels that were affected by it. So kind of turning some data into information. Learn how to use the GRASS plugin, in this case, to do network analysis, um, fastest route, shortest route, and then also break um, a street network into use areas. This is actually the San Francisco street network um, broken into areas based on, um, I think it's police precincts, I can't remember. And then some basic terrain analysis, how to develop a hillshade, slope, aspect, um, those DEM related rasters. The 103 course focuses on data acquisition and data management. So in this course, there's a lab on how to set up a spatial light database um, within QGIS, populate that with data how to work with topology, so look at the relationships between features and use that to QA, QC, a parcel database, and then use your vector editing skills to repair what errors you find. Learn how to um, look at metadata, learn what metadata is and how to explore that from within QGIS. Then the 104 class focuses on cartography, and this goes beyond QGIS and uses the, the vector editing open source package Inkscape in combination with QGIS. So students learn how to, um, first of all, deal with the issue of coordinate systems in this course and um, get data layers and different CRSs to align. And then there's a few labs on cartography where you start out developing a map, styling all the layers in QGIS, export that as SVG, bring it into Inkscape, and finish the map in Inkscape. So it's a good lab. It covers some of the gotchas in that workflow. And the final course focuses on remote sensing. So this class 
uses QGIS, but it also uses um, standalone grass as well as the grass plugin, um, depending on which lab the, you're on. So you learn about um, satellite imagery, multi-band imagery, and some of the issues with that, band combinations, NDVI, calculating NDVI from a Landsat image. And then the last several labs focus on the difference between a supervised and unsupervised classification of satellite imagery. So, Phil, I think this is where I turn it back over to Phil. You want right. And uh, before Kirk comes down and we switch microphones, do you have any questions on the actual courses themselves? Kirk might ask uh, how long are these courses? Well, it's in, in person hours, I'm not sure if I can give a good answer, but they're designed to be full semester college courses. So there are also um, quizzes and midterm and final exams associated with these and all the lecture material in addition to the labs. So um, we've been teaching this in, in an online forum recently, which Phil will talk about in a, in a kind of a continuing ed format. And students can f do a course in a month if they you know, work at it. So, you know, if you were really fast, you could probably do one in two weeks. Um, slower learners might take a couple months. How often do you need to update the course material for new versions of the software and course that come out? Yeah, that's becoming a big issue. Um, you know, we developed these courses last summer when we were at QGIS 2.2, and now we're at 2.8. So um, with the material being, or the software coming through updates every four months, we're finding that um, we're actually going through the exercise of updating them now to 2.8. Um, so I'm glad that they're at the long-term release um, point here with QGIS. So probably at this point we can get away with updating them once a year. Is there any effort to like harmonize with the QGIS training manual, which has ten, you know, massive amount of information in there? I worked on that as well. Myself. Um, no, not, I mean, not, not directly, no. Um, we. Like Agreed. Yeah, agreed. The, like Phil said, these were aligned with the um, GTCM, this hierarchical model that the Department of Labor came out with for um, what skills and abilities a GIS specialist needs to have uh, in the market today. And so they're not, I guess the one difference would be that these are teaching general GIS using QGIS and GRASS instead of just learning how to use the different functions in GRASS. So there's a, a little bit of difference, but I yeah, think there's, there's a... More yeah, there's a lot of overlap, for sure. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense to have two big sets of repositories. Well, this, is, this will be the last version to get out of us because the money runs out <laughs> at the end of the summer. Okay. And so what we're going to do, what we've been doing is turn this over to the community. And if the QG project or whoever wants to pick up on it, please, it's, it's all I under the latest version of Creative Commons. Yeah, it's also in, in GitHub, so we've, we've yeah, got it. Just gonna ask that. Word, basically Word and PowerPoint. Well, we've got it in Markdown language in GitHub as well. It's in Markdown. <coughs> Is there room for the potential to incorporate some scripting and Oh, I think there's plenty of room for, yeah, more advanced topics in this. Absolutely. And even topical courses. I'm actually developing a, a public health companion course kind of written in the same style as this right now for public health professionals that want to use QGIS. So I, th I think there's a lot of room for more. Yeah, and we're getting some traction in terms of adoption, people adopting this. I just got an event, an event right invite today from one of the professors that helped, uh, it's actually a student in one of the saying he's going to be teaching an introduction to QGIS workshop in Kentucky this summer based on some material that we've done. So, and there's people in Finland I know that are using it, people in Denmark using the material right now. So it was never meant to be anything more than a starting point, just an introductory for an introductory uh, to the GIS. Yeah, I was going to ask sort of a similar question, like what, you know, I, I, I know way back when, once upon a time, I took a class in GIS, you know, programming between CompSci and, and I wonder, you know, how, how, do, how do we go about adding a module in the same style about creating a plug-in or doing coding? You know? Well, the, the answer to that question is, let's create this community of practice that we talked about. Once that COP, the community practice of educators and industry people come together and work, together on this, then, then we can do all kinds of really wonderful things. Again, this was just a Kickstarter. Yeah. Great questions, by the way. Thank you.
Did you have a question? Yeah, I was at, honestly unaware of that until I heard the same talk. So um, I think there's always room for collaborating and. They have some lessons that specifically to go to DB and some are general, like for introduction to map design as a general concept for GIS. Right. Can you have a question? Um, yeah, he was talking about the, the previous talk covered uh, um, Cardo DB, and, and there was um, the Cardo DB Academy was, was discussed in the previous talk. And so he was asking if there was any room for collaboration with efforts like that. Definitely. Yes, sir. One last question. Sorry, I won't be faster. Um, I, I just been used as a MOOC yet, or I, I know there. Yeah, I'm just going to cover that. Okay, go ahead. So the results so far, we've got five courses that are published and reuse out on our GitHub. We've had 7,500 people enroll in one of our free courses in the last basically 10 months. About a dozen co colleges have adopted the curriculum uh, that I'm aware of. And again, a lot of the adoption may be happening that I'm not aware of. Uh, our website's had more than 50,000 visits, which I think is pretty interesting, just based upon the little social media spamming that I do. Uh, our partner colleges now uh, have members. Uh, we are now members of the Geo for All initiative. And we literally have impacted educators, trainers, professionals from every continent in the globe, including a lot of third world nations, what you might think of as third world nations in terms of their uh, economics. So this is just a screenshot of the Academy website. And on March 8th, we had hit right at about 50,000 views, which I think is uh, fairly impressive since it's just a, basically just a WordPress site. Uh, we're currently offering, uh, right now, we're in the second of a four week MOOC on the Canvas network. So there's Coursera and edX and the big guys, right? We have to be an Ivy League multi-million dollar MOOC to get on there. So there's the second level players, which is the Canvas network, and that's where we're currently uh, playing. And uh, this is a screenshot of the uh, opening page for the Canvas MOOC, which started uh, at the last week of February. Uh, this is what the landing page looks like. There's the first couple of modules and the uh, second module. I would note down there in the lower right, it's all licensed under Creative Commons. Kind of hard to see, but the little red arrow down there. So all the material, again, is for free re redistribution. We're not copywriting this. We're not literally not making a dime off of this uh, in terms of our personal. It's just a matter where we have federal grants and we're trying to push the material out for people to use. Um, the MOOC currently is at about 4,500 people that enrolled. But if you know anything about MOOCs, there's the number of people that enroll and there's the people that participate, right? And they're not the same. How many of you just heard the recent, uh, I, I know, uh, Directions Media just put on uh, 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 the GeoInt. They had a webinar talking about their 21,000 person MOOC that they just completed here in March. And the, the two presenters from Penn State talked about they had 21,000 people enrolled. And they literally had 1,100 people uh, complete uh, the course, which is, is pretty good, actually. So uh, these are some testimonials just off people that have signed up for the MOOC. The first assignment was basically introduce yourself. So you see, we've got a gentleman from, uh, from Bangladesh, and they're using the course to help him do baseline surveying. Here's another gentleman, uh, Jacob from Tennessee. He's using GIS. Uh, and a lot of these people, you notice, are, are current ArcGIS users that are looking to expand their skill set. Here's another gentleman who says, I'm currently assessing whether QGIS is suitable to teach in introductory courses uh, at the University of Twente in the Netherlands. So ag again, a lot of educators, a lot of practitioners uh, looking at using this. Uh, this one I like, a recovering novice Esri uh, user determined to use QGIS in Western North Carolina. Uh, here's a person from Iceland using it. Uh, another person from South Africa uh, using it for community dynamics in a rural area. And then just a couple more. Here's one in Boston, Massachusetts looking at Community Development Corporation. Person working for the Belgium Technology, uh, Technical Corporation in Niger. Uh, somebody from the Bass Company, and then somebody from uh, Egypt. So literally, we've got users uh, basically all over the place. Uh, just for the MOOC itself, we've had 4,500 enrolled, 1,100 have completed the first assignment, 500 have actually completed the first lab and uploaded it, and that, that was done within the first 72 hours. I was pretty impressed with that. 
Uh, engagement completion rates more or less matches uh, the recent Penn State, which said they had 21,000 enrolled and 1,100 completers. Uh, I will tell you that this MOOC is built on a shoestring. It's basically my effort. So it's, it's the material that these gentlemen have created, plus a little bit that I know about Canvas networking and putting it all together. Uh, and if you, you can't really compare it to a MOOC like Penn State put on, because they have big names behind them. Esri, the development team at Esri, Coursera, which has a very uh, deep team, and they literally spend tens of thousands of dollars developing their MOOCs. Mine was a couple hundred dollars of my time, I guess. Uh, but it does demonstrate the potential for online offerings of Foz 4 g technical training and education. And I'm a big proponent of online teaching, not because it's a preferred method. Believe me, I'm a classic face-to-face. -face. It's no, nothing better than one-on-one -on -one with a teacher. But if you're in the wilds of Nigeria or if you're in, you know, the wilds of, the wilds of Detroit or whatever, it might be the only, the only opportunity you have. And so for that vastly underserved population, I think it's behooven upon us to try to, 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 solve, to uh, help these people. So what's going to happen in the future? I don't know. <laughs> Currently, we're re rebuilding all the five courses using the latest 2.8. Uh, that publication date will be in July 2015. We're working with several vendors right now to try to commercialize the Geoacademy material, that is, basically monetize it. Uh, we're pushing to gain further adoption through the Open Educational Resource Organization. So. Any place I see that will let me put my curriculum material, that's where I want to publish it so more people will get a hold of it. Uh, we're all working with the Geo for All initiative, trying to push greater participation in open source in general, totally separate from this curriculum, just in general trying to get open source into higher ed. Um, we wish to incorporate QGIS project provider vended certification. So I'm really hoping that the QGIS project will follow through on what I've seen on the listservs, which is they're going to do certification internally. They're going to be the ones that are going to create it and control it, which I think is who needs to do that. And then we, the academics, will follow behind and try to train our students to that. Uh, and then we do have a pending National Science Foundation proposal to develop a formal geospatial academy and spread phosphor G among uh, colleges and universities if, if that's possible. These are just some of the websites that we've set up over the years. Um, you can always go to one of the easy member is phosphor G, phosphorgeo.org, and from there you can get to the other ones. And then finally, our contact information. And that's all I've got. Go the the Pardon me? What was the difference between the paid canvas and the free canvas? I just saw that on the last slide. Yeah the, uh, yeah, the paid one that, were, that actually starts in April, um, those are limited to 25 people. And sorry, but the cohort's already full. And those will be instructor-led. The MOOC, obviously, be, and the reason we can offer them so cheaply is because the SMEs that teach that get subsidized by the Department of Labor. And the reason we have to charge anything is the Department of Labor says you have to charge a minimum. You can't give that away. That was part of the restrictions they put on the TAC grant. So that's kind of how we came up with that. And those are being offered through our continuing ed. So you get a CE certificate at the end of it if you complete with an 85 or better. Okay. All right. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Onboarding as in? Well, all I can offer you, tell you, is what I've already said, which is first join the GEO for All. That's not us. That's an OSGO. That'll be around. That's a project. That's free. And once you get on that and get on the listserv, you'll start seeing all kinds of resources. And the second thing is all of our material can be downloaded and basically adopted and used in your own learning management system uh, instantly if you want. To take our curriculum and use it in some other software? I'm, I'm missing the question there. Or the so our universities are teaching through Esri? Yeah. Is it difficult to get them to blend curriculum? Or oh, 
you talking about the the university? I, I can't speak for the university, it, but you have to, typically to get open source in in any organization, you have to have an advocate. Yeah. So if you have somebody that's really passionate about it, it'll happen. If you don't, it won't happen. Right. And that's the community of practice that we've been lacking, and that we're I, I keep trying to build over the years. So, so really, and, and at this point, I would say it's up to the industry to spark that. So it's not just the academics. We're we're not really leaders. We're followers. I hate to say in most cases. So the 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 people that run this industry, the geniuses, the coders, and the hackers and the crackers, they need to reach out to the academics and kind of poke them and say, "Hey, look, I got this great material. Why don't you use it? And I'll help you train or whatever." Uh -huh. to build the curriculum for online training, and we've had some pretty good success in standing our firm in instantiation and building training. Well, that's, uh, that's a good testimonial. I mean, I'm just saying it may be something for you down the okay. road. Okay. Well, I, I hope you'll be there tomorrow night at 8.30 so we can talk about this further. One last plug for the bird of feather. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone.